I am back with another Sonic for the Commander X16 video, and this time I have a completely playable version available for download. While my initial idea of posting devlogs for each step of the way, the actual Commander X16 project itself has forced my schedule a bit, as it is more important to have a full 8-bit representation available before it is too late. Adding physics to Sonic is an important step and would be a perfect video as well, but that would not truly be an 8-bit game when using Vera FX to perform 32-bit multiplications and additions. Thankfully, the game in its 8-bit form is impressive enough, I would say. I have only known 6502 Assembler for about 10 months, and while I was learning it, I was trying to find the most optimal way of doing every required thing that a Sonic game needs, and to my surprise, I couldn't really find any clever way to write the code other than just using what every 6502 coder have done since the 80s. Seriously, all tricks that I have learned from programming other languages are kinda redundant. And to my surprise, I hit the targets. Some of them are actually comparable to 32-bit console games. Ridiculous, I know. But let's directly compare my Sonic game against some of the heavy lift champions of the 2D 16-bit and 32-bit games. From my previous devlogs I had lofty goals, all in a list of priority rules. Priority rules 1 and 4 on my Sonic game was pixel perfection and multi-level interaction. Pixel perfect games have existed since Super Mario Bros. from 1985, and probably before that. But it is still failed by the majority of games for the reason that math without context can't single-handedly express solutions that fit perfectly in a complex grid. There are artistic measures required and specific rules that might not accurately represent reality. A quite easy way to understand this problem is to look at fonts on a computer display and see all the tweaks and hacks that are applied to make text readable. Making a pixel perfect Sonic game is like making a font engine, but the letters move around in synchronization. Still, you as a reader of that text must see the letters without getting motion sick. And the better and cleaner that feedback is, the better you as a user can interact with it. That makes the game better. The makers of Super Mario Bros. understood this very early on, and Sonic just had to keep up with the same rules of quality. Easily said than done. That gets us into multi level interaction. Showing one pixel perfect thing on the screen is easy, but having multiple interacting pixel perfect things at once that can be changed dynamically depending on your input, well that is hard. So this is Super Mario World from 1990, a 16-bit game for the Super Nintendo or SNES for short. The SNES has enough CPU power to do this, which was impressive in 1990. Now let's try multi-level interaction in this game. The player Mario is riding Yoshi, and Yoshi is standing on a moving platform with a complex motion that means some pixels are involved. This is and should be pixel perfect in a Mario game. So what happens if Mario jumps off Yoshi? Can you guess? By today's 128-bit CPU standards, you would probably expect Yoshi staying by himself on the platform as Mario jumps off. But no, this is a 16-bit game. New Super Mario Bros for the Nintendo DS. This is the first 2D Mario games that allows multiple enemies to ride platforms. It still was a multi-level interaction because interactable blocks were missing. A true multi-level interaction requires an interactive block to ride a platform and the player to ride or be pushed by that interactive block, as well as the interactive block reacting to walls as the platform moves it into said walls. And not to forget the player also reacting to said walls indirectly by the platform moving the interactable block while the block reacts to walls. It sounds messy, but it gets even more messier if you add more interactive blocks and they also interact with each other. New Super Mario Bros. Wii from 2009 adds this complexity, but doesn't handle the interactive blocks touching each other in a particular way and sends those blocks into a bouncy state to hope that no one noticed. These blocks are the carryable light blocks, propeller blocks and power blocks, and some of them must already be riding platforms to work. New Super Mario Bros. for the Nintendo DS was the last game to support horizontal screen wrapping and level wrapping. The implementation of wrapping was added on top of an already complex collision system, making the code path for collision so-called worst case. 
One enemy must collide with the player and all other enemies, not only in the current screen, but the negative wrapped screen as well. And only when all collisions have been checked can it be considered cancelable. For more enemies, the amount of collisions grew exponentially by default, but with wrapping it doubles that. And of course, you want to limit the number of collision tests, so you want to abort the test as soon as you can. But that is not possible with this written wrapping system. The system failed so badly on New Super Mario Bros. Wii that it was completely removed in every future Mario game game since then. If a crushing stone block is pushing Mario at the wrapping point, Mario dies because he doesn't know where he is relative to the stone block in this wrapped space. This is not just limited to screen wrapping, but level wrapping as well. We must not forget that the faster the stone block or any platform is moving, the player or rider will wobble into any walls as Mario games aren't simply designed to handle those cases. This is more common than you think, and it makes pixel perfect interaction fail quite badly. And then we are arriving at the semi-solid platforms. Moving of static ones got more and more accuracy with every new release of a new Super Mario Bros game, mainly because of available CPU power, but in the Nintendo DS one, as well as the 16-bit Super Mario World, the accuracy of the collision is very granular, so when Mario jumps and can't fully reach the top of these platforms, instead of falling down, he snaps up to them in an unrealistic way. In the DS game, enemies and Mario get picked up when the platform are in their bottom arc motion and haven't yet turned around. Such snappy movements feel very unnatural since the player wasn't even jumping or doing anything. The more you think about this problem, the more impressed you will be when you'll see moving platforms versus slopes and no visual snapping for sloped semi-solid ground. Now when you have seen these 16-bit and 32-bit games in action, let's compare it to my Sonic game. This is a real hardware video captured from the Commander X16 8-bit computer. I have invented a new form of monitor item box, which is now fully interactable. The player can push it or be pushed by it. And as you will see later, it can ride platforms, kill Sonic, and have enemies and Sonic ride on top of itself. This is a true multi-level interaction and it is pixel perfect too. Just check out how Sonic is being pushed against the wall and the interactive block is being pushed as well by the wall. And wait until you see that interaction over the horizontal screen wrapping point. There's no weird bugs here. For the moving platforms, as well as picking up Sonic without snapping, it does the same for the enemies and for the monitor. It doesn't matter what direction the platform is moving, and it is multi-level interaction as well as pixel perfect. For moving platforms and solid moving ones, they will also push Sonic and other interactable objects through the bottom of semi-solid ground, and that is sloped ground as well. No snapping happens here. The amount of multi-level interactions and pixel perfect motions are taxing to the CPU. There's a frame budget of 60 frames per second to be upheld. Once the limit is reached and the CPU can't finish the frame on time, which can be seen when the water is rising or descending, the slowed down frame will stay pixel perfect. It just works. New Super Mario DS ran on a 32-bit RISC CPU at 67 MHz from the year 2000. My game runs on an 8-bit CISC CPU at 8 MHz from 1983. might have questions at this time. Why is it even possible to do all this in 8-bit? Why didn't games do this back in the 80s? And why doesn't modern games do these things? All of these questions are valid ones, and I ask them all the time. The 8-bit one is very tricky to answer, since the 6502 CPU instructions are so insanely limiting and low budget, you can't do the most simple things without you having to squeeze out brain liquid through your ears. For the modern games question, all I can think of is the inaccuracy of floating point math, and developers thinking that physics will look good with timestamps that just can't be motion perfect and interact with the other physics objects in a visually pleasing way. By the way, all the stuff you see right now is done with 8-bit code and the base RAM of 512 kilobytes. The few 
future of the Commander X-16 is very sad as it is catering to price and the decision to use a 16-bit CPU instead of an 8-bit reflects badly on my own project but also on others that are currently developing for the Commander X-16. This decision is quite hurtful to us developers that invested our time and money into the Commander X-16 project. Once the Commander X-16 GS comes out, it will have the same CPU as the Nintendo SNES, the 65C816. So in theory, all games developed for the platform will have to compete against at least Super Mario World quality. For myself, 16-bit and the amount of built-in RAM, 32 megabytes, like... <laughs> Let's just install Linux and run Doom, right? For future viewers of this video, in the making of this video and the release of my Sonic game, the Commander X16 was still proudly 8-bit. 